though the United States still maintains plenty of influence, and I'd like to see it using that more diplomatically, using it more to help resolve current conflicts or pre prevent those that are emerging. I think Yemen is a tragedy. I think that's a, a conflict, for example, that the United States could have helped to prevent from happening by vigor vigorous diplomacy before it happened. So very happy to introduce uh, Michelle Dunn, uh, who will be speaking on Middle East regional turmoil. Uh, she directs the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington and came up today to be with us. Her research focuses on political and economic change in Arab countries, particularly Egypt, as well as U.S. policies in the Middle East. Uh, she was the founding director of the Rafiq Hariri Center for the Middle East at the Atlantic Council, as well as editor of the Arab Reform Bulletin at Carnegie. Uh, before that, she was a Middle East specialist uh, at the State Department for nearly 20 years, serving in assignments that included the National Security Council staff, Secretary's policy planning staff, the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, and the U.S. Consulate General in Jerusalem. She also served as a visiting professor of Arabic language and Arabic studies at Georgetown University, where she obtained her Ph.D. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Dunn. And I'm happy that, uh, that you're interested in the Middle East, interested enough to come out this evening because many Americans have given up caring about the Middle East. And it's, it's understandable, you know, it's been a rough time. It's been a rough time in the region. Uh, it's been a rough time for the United States for American involvement there. Um, what, I, what I'm hoping to do in our brief time together this evening is to, um, suggest some new ways of looking at the Middle East and possibly even some, create a little, a little bit of hope in you about where things in the Middle East are going to go. So I'm gonna start with just a, just a very brief description of what I would say is going on in the surf, on the surface in the Middle East, the kind of the Middle East regional turmoil that I was asked to speak about. But then I really wanna spend time on why I think this is happening, what's going on, and, and uh, how we can understand it. And then I'll end with a few brief thoughts about U.S. policy in the region uh, and how the United States might find its way toward a new, uh, less complicated, and, and I think more constructive way of uh, engaging with the Middle East. So first of all, Middle East, what am I talking about? I mean, geographically, I'm gonna be talking about the region from Morocco in the west to Iran in the east. Uh, I'm not going to include Afghanistan in this talk, and my primary focus is going to be on the Arabic-speaking countries, although, of course, I, I will make reference to Iran, to Israel, to Turkey. They're all very important players uh, in this region. So on the surface, you know, there are terrible wars raging uh, in Syria and Yemen, a third in Libya, and they've caused humanitarian catastrophes that are even greater than those of previous decades. And we know about the catastrophes of previous decades. Uh, the the in invasion of Iraq in the 2000s, um, the, uh, the Iran-Iraq War, the Algerian uh, Civil War of the 1990s, the Lebanese Civil War of the 1980s. There have been many destructive wars. Um, but these wars that have broken out in the last few years have left hundreds of thousands dead, millions displaced or made refugees, hunger, disease, destruction, uh, really something even, even beyond what we've seen in most of the previous decades. And we've got power, uh, power, regional powers, whether it's, whether it's Iran, whether it's some of the Gulf states and external powers like Russia, uh, as well as the United States, to some extent, intervening militarily in this region. Now, there is there is some hope that some of these con conflicts, especially the ones in especially in Yemen and Syria, may be winding down. Although they're not necessarily living leaving those countries and the people in them in a very happy situation. Um, there's a lot of tension, of course, between Iran and a lot of the other regional powers, between Iran and Israel on one hand, Iran and Saudi Arabia, 
uh, on the other hand, uh, and Iran is extensively involved in the region. Um, but you know, these these are the things that are 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 going on. You know, um, as I said, on the surface. There's also this new wave of popular uprisings going on uh, in this year alone. Major popular uprisings in Sudan, Algeria, which is going to have a very controversial presidential election, just a couple of days, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, and, and Iran. So, you know, why is this happening? And, um, you know, this can be a bit of a Rorschach test. You know, people look at why there's all these problems in the Middle East and everybody's kind of got their their, their own explanation, uh, U.S. invasion of Iraq, which you know, destabilized the region, paved its way for Iranian uh, aggression and expansion in the region, as well, of course, of causing very, very extensive uh, Iraqi casualties and refugee flows. Um, another explanation that people sometimes give are U.S. attempts to sort of foist democracy on the region, on countries that were not ready for it. Um, U.S. attempts to withdraw from the region um, can be seen as destabilizing, whether in some ways under President Obama or currently under President Trump. Uh, ancient rivalries like sunni Shia rivalries, uh, so forth. We, we can discuss all of these theories, if you like, and, and each of them you know, has some merit. There's something, there's something to each of these. But what I want to talk about today is something much lar larger that I see going on, real tectonic shifts in this region, megatrends that I see as causing the earthquakes that we're now seeing on the surface. Um, so as I mentioned, you, you've undoubtedly heard of the Arab Spring, uh, of this series of uprisings that happened back in 2011, and now we're seeing uh, a second wave of uprisings in, in a different set of countries. And I just, I'm gonna show you a few slides just to sort of, so you can get a sense of how many countries this is now affecting. All right, so, um, you know, the, these are the countries that were affected by uh, uprisings in 2011. These, these popular uprisings calling for bread, freedom, social justice, dignity, et cetera. Now, in, in several of those countries that had uprisings, there were leaders who were uh, deposed. Of all the countries that, in which leaders were deposed, it's only Tunisia which you can see up there on the Mediterranean coast of Africa, that has made it to a democratic system, has, has made, brought about a, generally a very positive political transition in the country, although it still has a lot of, um, a lot of economic challenges. Uh, some of the other uprisings, uh, like in Bahrain, which had an uprising, but where the leader was not deposed, was crushed. Egypt, uh, the leader was deposed, and it, Egypt went through a brief political opening, but then descended into harsher forms of authoritarianism. You know, what's worse is, is several of the countries that underwent uprisings, now you see the ones striped in red, ended up in military conflict, ended up in internal wars and then external interventions. All of those countries have uh, outside powers um, intervening militarily uh, and, and bringing about, as I said, terrible humanitarian, um, humanitarian suffering. Now we're coming up to 2019. So the countries you see in brown there have had significant popular uprisings during 2019. Um, and this new wave of uprisings was targeted um, in some ways similar to the 2011 uprisings, but now focusing a little bit more on economic injustice, economic hardship, and corruption by high-level officials. Now in the new uprisings, we've seen authoritarian leaders deposed in a couple of countries. The countries there striped with blue, Algeria and Sudan. 
And then further, we've had uh, a couple of other countries like Iraq and Lebanon didn't, didn't really have, you know, they have semi-democratic regimes, or, sorry, semi-democratic systems rather, and they not authoritarian regimes, and there was no authoritarian leader to depose. But it did end up in both Iraq and Lebanon with the resignation of the prime minister and the government, okay? Uh, and, um, so, you know, I, I just want you to look at the number of countries that are affected by this. You know, if you look at this region, these are, these are all the countries, there have been significant popular uprisings, not just a few demonstrations. If I wanted to put on this map all the countries where there have been, you know, some significant protests, there would be even, even more color on, on those countries, all right? So what was in common between the 2011 and the 2019 uprisings? massive popular dissatisfaction with governments due to economic hardship, um, institutionalized corruption, and basically poor, poor governance, poor government services. And these are all related, right, because the, the lack of economic opportunity and, um, and, and corruption are the things that really end up causing the poor government services. I mean, you probably heard in Lebanon about things like, you know, the electricity doesn't operate, uh, garbage isn't picked up, uh, the internet doesn't operate. Lebanon's not really a poor country. These things shouldn't be happening there. But it, it's, it's related to institutionalized corruption. And what's happened in, in really all of these countries that have had uprisings is that protesters start out with specific grievances but then they end up joining together in a call, not only to bring down a leader and to bring down a current government, but actually for changes to the system. So for example, in Iraq and in Lebanon now, people calling for changes to these sectarian bargains um, that are part of their political systems and that end up leading to this, to this institutionalized corruption. In Algeria and Sudan, people calling for an end to military domination of their governments. So let's return to the question now of, you know, why has this happened? Why, ha why have all these uprisings happened in all these countries? Um, wh why has this rift developed between the government and the governed in so many Arab countries. Um, and I would say, you know, if I had to put it into, I, I'm just gonna really raise two major factors, okay? And those two factors are oil and people. Okay, and uh, so let me, let me start with oil, okay? Um, oil, you know, has been, the blessing and the curse, you know, of this region. You know, in short, what has happened is that so many governments in this region have been able to rely on revenue, to run their governments on revenue pulled out of the ground from oil and gas, or some of the other com countries that don't necessarily have much oil and gas are able to derive basically political rents from those who have the oil and gas. So it ends up in a situation in which very few countries in the region have productive economies. Okay, the economies are very much skewed and the interaction of, of this whole region with the rest of the world, the economic and I would also say the political interaction with the rest of the world is skewed by the fact that there has been so much oil and gas coming out of this region. And now also living on uh, hydrocarbon rents or political rents has meant that governments really didn't need to tax their citizens. So they taxed them either very little or in, or in some countries not at all. And therefore, the citizens didn't demand accountability from their governments. Okay, there's a quote here, a very famous quote from Samuel Huntington uh, about, and he's not speaking about the, the uh, Arab countries here necessarily, but uh, about how, how this happens in countries that have, uh, have these kind of revenues or rents from, from uh, oil. So, you know, for a long time, there was this bargain or social contract 
uh, that meant that um, governments could dole out services and benefits to their citizens, you know, more in the richer countries, a little bit less in the poorer countries, at levels that were somehow acceptable to the citizens. And the citizens gave their loyalty to the governments, and they understand that they didn't have much input into decision making, they didn't have much ability to criticize or to hold the government accountable, but after all, they were getting something for free or almost free from their governments. This is a gross generalization, okay? And there, there are exceptions to this rule, but I'm just trying to kind of paint what I see as the big picture here. All right, that's the oil side. Let's turn to the people side. So in the mean, meanwhile, even over these decades uh, in which there was so much oil wealth washing around this region, the population of the Arab countries grew massively, more quickly than in any region of the world except uh, sub-Saharan Africa. By, uh, by, by 28, 29, 2010 or so, the region had an enormous youth bulge. Uh, I don't know if you've seen these kind of population pyramids before, but you know, they, break down, they break down population by age group. And you can kind of tell you know, what, what, what's, what are the different age cohorts in a country by the shape of these graphs. So I just, just chose uh, the year 2014 and uh, to show you Egypt and to contrast that with the United States. So down at the bottom, the, the more of a pyramid um, that, a, that a, uh, a country has, the more youthful their population is. So you see how a country like Egypt had a huge number of young people. Uh, by contrast to the United States, and by the way, the United States is, is relatively youthful. I mean, if I were to put up a lot of European countries or Japan here, this would look even, even different and it would be very narrow down at the bottom, right? The United States is still fairly broad at the bottom, but you see how Egypt's is much broader, right? It's showing you that there's this very, very large youthful population. So what, you know, what started happening was there was just no way that the governments in this region with the exception of a few countries that had a lot of oil wealth and very small populations. Most governments, most of the Arab governments could not provide jobs for all these young people. They certainly couldn't um, employ them inside the government, which is what, what they had been doing for the large, uh, to a large extent. And outside the government, private sectors were very constrained in a lot of these countries. Frankly, they're captured by small political elites connected to the government. And so, as I said, the economies are not productive. Um, they're generally not very linked to the global economy when you take out oil and gas. And the economies were just not creating jobs. In addition to this, because uh, the Arab countries, you know, generally saw their wealth coming from uh, rents, they really were not training their labor forces to be competitive in the global economy. And they've also historically had the, the lowest level of female participation in the labor force uh, of any area in the world. By the time the, the 2010 uh, or 2011 uprisings came, the Arab region had the highest level of youth unemployment in the world. Now, some of these problems were not unknown in the region. There was a series of, of reports done by Arab social scientists called the Arab Human Development Reports done under the auspices of the UN. I mean, here's one, for the, the first one from 2002, um, very much um, you know, identified these, these deficits, uh, saying that the Arab region is really behind in human development, in, in, in education, and so forth. And the, the three deficits that uh, the Arab Human, Developments, Arab Human Development reports identified were, were freedom, women's empowerment, and knowledge. Knowledge being the quality of education, research, things like that, that were very, very weak. Um, in the, in the Arab countries. So, you know, we have uh, growing populations and um, economies that are not by no means keeping pace in creating jobs and governments that are not 
able to provide services, gov the quality of government services in all but the richest countries declining in some ways because they just kind of can't keep pace. And citizens becoming more and more aware of this because of the communications revolution, because of people being able to watch satellite television and look at the internet and so forth and find out what's going on. Now at the same time, to go back to oil for a minute, changing world energy markets whether we're talking about the increased share of renewables or the advent of shale oil and gas, meant that, and th this didn't happen at the time of the, the first Arab uprisings, but it has happened since then. If you look at the latter part, you see how oil prices have really tanked. Uh, so the, the, the Arab region still has a lot of oil and gas, and that those resources are still needed and still, still needed by the global economy and still important. However, they are much less valuable relatively than they used to be, right, because of uh, other kinds of energy being on the world market. So this has radically changed not only um, how much money the Arab governments have to spend and how large their reserve, the reserves that they're sitting on are, it also has changed how other countries, I think including the United States, deal with this region. So, that's it in a nutshell. Uh, governments have less to spend in the Arab region, but they've got a lot more people. And citizens are increasingly fed up with how little they're getting, and in some cases how poorly they're treated by corrupt and in some cases abusive government officials. So the old social contract of government will dole out services, citizens be loyal and quiet um, is, is not working well in many countries in the region. But new social contracts, new arrangements, new ways of, of governments and citizens dealing with each other haven't really emerged yet, except, as I mentioned, perhaps in Tunisia, where you know, it's trying to, trying to find its way. It has developed a democratic political system. It's still struggling with um, changing its economy to make its economy more, more productive. Um, so, Let's look again at our, our map. This is, this is where things stand now in terms of countries that have had a lot of upheaval and so forth. So look at the countries now that there, where there hasn't been any upheaval. And um, they are all monarchies. All the countries that uh, have, Bahrain is the, the only monarchy to have had a significant uprising. There certainly have been protests um, in, in other countries, but, but Bahrain was the only one where protesters were really you know, calling for a profound change in the system. And I think there's a reason for that because as you may know, the Bahraini monarchy is closely identified with only you know, one, one half or so, or maybe even less than half of the, of the population, the Sunni Muslim as opposed to Shi'i Muslim population, and therefore did not enjoy across the board support. But, um, now, um, we're, these are monarchies. Um, some are more absolute than others. Some of them have some different kinds of political participation, whether they're parliaments, whether they are kind of tribal arrangements that include some, some power sharing or in which the monarch is you know, significantly constrained by, by uh, other kinds of political activity. But on some of these, uh, but, but they have seen some of them significant protests. And I would say, you know, particularly Morocco and Jordan in the last few years have been seeing on and off some significant protests. Another factor is some of these countries have aging or unwell leaders without firmly settled successions. And that can be another thing that can cause, uh, cause, cause an, uh, not cause an uprising, but it can be a factor that, that um, encourages the population to rise up if they feel that, that um, the elite is not solid. I would say some of these countries, perhaps Morocco, Oman, Kuwait, you know, have leaders who are either aging or, or unwell and in which the succession is not completely clear. Saudi Arabia, um, is in the process of a succession with a, uh, with a very volatile, um, some would say reckless crown prince who is uh, undertaking some bold reforms but also using great brutality. So I think that's a question mark to me too in terms of 
um, the, the Saudi monarchy. Are, are any of these countries absolutely immune from popular uprisings that could bring about real change? Probably very few. I mean, there are a couple of them, and I would say the United Arab Emirates and Qatar um, are, you know, they're, they have such small populations and a great deal of wealth that uprisings there are much less likely. But many of these countries, again, I would, I would say Morocco and Jordan in particular, suffer from some of the same problems as the other countries that had big uprisings. Economic inequality and poverty, corruption, uh, poor government services. Um, the, the monarchs do enjoy some popular support, some popular legitimacy, I would say, especially the Moroccan monarchy is very deeply rooted in Moroccan society and history. But as we've seen, there, you can't take anything for granted in this region anymore. Uh, this region, it includes the Arab countries, and I would, I would put Iran in this as well, is in the middle of a, what I would call an epic transformation from what it has been for nearly a century, which was an oil exporting region uh, dominated by authoritarian leaders of one kind or another. It's in the middle of a transformation from that to something else. But we don't know what that something else really is, right? Um, we don't know, you know, so protests, uprising, leaders deposed, governments resigning, economic crises, uh, internal conflicts, external intervention, proxy wars, et cetera. I'm afraid to say that this is the new normal in the Middle East for, for a while, for a decade or two at least. But I did promise you some hope, right? So here's where that comes. Again, back to people, uh, back to demography. Eventually, these countries are going to reach a new equilibrium. Uh, perhaps when the youth bulge is passed and populations have a higher average age, which is often associated with more stability. Um, this is just a, a graph from, um, from UNICEF, and it shows, you know, there's this kind of a demographic sweet spot that countries uh, eventually get into when they have a lot of young and middle-aged people who are ready and able to work. You have a lot of people in the labor force, and they don't have too many elderly people or young people, children, whom they have to support, okay? And this is an opportunity. For, for real progress. This is an opportunity for economic takeoff. And the Arab countries are headed uh, toward this place. Um, there are, you know, if you, this is, now the population in the Middle East is growing and it's going to continue to grow for a while. But what this is showing you is the uh, percentage of population growth. So what it's showing you is that the, the percentage of increase is already falling. And we already have a number of countries in the region that are at uh, already at or near replacement level. Okay, so that's you know obviously when uh, uh, the average woman is having two children or, or so you know then you're at replacement level. Some of these countries are there or even below that, um, and some of them are there because uh, like Lebanon and Tunisia that um, they have a high level, relatively high level of women's empowerment, women's participation in the labor force, which of course is associated with women having fewer children. And, uh, and then others like uh, Iran undertook a, a, a really big population control program uh, about 20 years ago and is very successful. And now Iran is at you know, pretty much zero growth, pretty much replacement level in population. There are other countries in the region, I would pull out Egypt, Iraq, Yemen, and a few others where population continues to grow rapidly. But it's, it's going to change. You, know, you might have seen some news that came out about six months ago that according to United Nations population projections, the world population is going to, uh, it's going to continue to grow for the rest of this century, but at a diminishing, diminishing rate, and we may actually reach a point by the end of this century where it stops growing, where world population levels off. Um, you know, Africa and the Middle East will be the last regions to, to reach that place of leveling off, but they, they will get there. Uh, and in fact, I think the Middle East will get there before Sub-Saharan Africa. So the question is, 
you know, when they, when they get to the point where population growth, they're already in it. They're already in the beginning of that demographic sweet spot. Some countries are already in that sweet spot where they have an opportunity. A lot of working people, not too many dependents, and they have the ability. They have a good demographic situation for political stability and for economic uh, takeoff. But it takes the right conditions, right? It takes broad-minded economic decision-making. It takes development of the labor force, development of human capital, which we know is missing. And it takes a, you know, a reasonable level of political stability to take advantage of that of that point, right? So that's, you know, that's, that's the, the hopeful point, that I think there's, there, there may be a better day coming in the Middle East. It's not now, and it's not gonna be for a while yet. It's starting to happen in some countries, but it could be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, the Middle East could be getting to a phase of its history where, as I said, it could find uh, a new and, and let's hope a, a, an equilibrium that more serves the interests of the people who live there, of the citizens. So now, what does all this mean um, for the United States? I'll just say a couple of words about this because I want to I want to turn to the discussion. So the Arab region is is going to continue to to pose challenges, to pose threats, terrorism, um, mass migration, threats to our security, and and also to the security of some of our allies, uh, our European allies in Israel. Um, for some time, this this is this is going to go on, and the Arab region is going to continue to experience humanitarian crises that place demands on the resources and the conscience of the international community, including to the the United States. So it's not really, you know, it's not really a question of of turning away completely. Now, the United States no longer wants to be the region's policeman. We did that for a long time, largely to you know, to secure access to oil and to protect Israel. Those were the, the main reasons why the United States was so involved. Uh, at the same time, you know, while the U.S. is lowering the tempo of its engagement uh, with the Middle East, we see that under President Trump, and we saw it under President Obama, too. We're not really pulling out. I mean, if you look at the 200,000 or so American de troops that are deployed around the world, about a third of them are, are in the Middle East. And I don't think that's going to change immediately. And we have a lot of concerns. We have concerns about creating vacuums there uh, of other powers, Russia, China, Iran, moving in, doing things that end up being very much against um, American interests, against the interests of our allies, and so forth. And we have very large security relationships, legacy relationships there in the region, uh, particularly with, with Israel, with Egypt, with Jordan, with Turkey, which is a NATO ally, we're not gonna just turn around and walk away from them. And in addition to that, we're selling a massive amount of arms to this region. Uh, the th three of the four biggest arms importers in the world are in this region, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Egypt. And who's selling them all those arms? We are, uh, and our allies in Europe. Uh, Russia and China too, but frankly, to a much lower, lower extent than we are. So let me just end with my thoughts on what the United States could do. I think we could rethink the increasingly securitized way that the United States has engaged with this region. Uh, while the United States is you know, by no means responsible for everything that's going on here, as I said, the, the turmoil that we see now has, has deep roots, right? But the United States has both uh, provoked wars and is fueling them now through arms sales and through uh, certain forms of security assistance. I mean, for example, our, our security assistance to Saudi Arabia and the UAE who are waging war in Yemen. Um, I think, though, the United States still maintains plenty of influence, and I'd like to see it using that more diplomatically, using it more to help resolve current conflicts or pre prevent those that are emerging. I think Yemen is a tragedy. I think that's a, a conflict, for example, that the United States could have helped to prevent from happening by vigor vigorous diplomacy before it happened. And um, yeah, rather than pretend we can just pull up stakes and walk away, which I predict will not happen, we will not do that. We will not pull up stakes and walk away. 
what we could do is kind of put on oil uh, put on autopilot all the kind of securitized ways we're dealing with the region and not deal with it in other ways. I think we we could, should think of ways in which the United States can um, encourage meaningful economic, social, and political development in this region so that it can take advantage of this better uh, demographic sweet spot that is now arriving. That doesn't mean we can fix all the problems in the region. That doesn't mean we can control what anybody else does. But I do think we can, uh, we can play a constructive role. We, we still have to look at what we do, <laughs> even if we don't control what other people do. We need to look ourselves in the mirror and say, well, what are we doing? Are we playing a constructive role? Are we playing a role that truly serves our interests as well as the interests of others, of the people in the region and of our allies? And I think we could re-engage uh, much more on this region with like-minded allies elsewhere in the world, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, rather than just you know, competing with them for arms sales, which is you know, sometimes what we, what we fall into. All of this that I am proposing, uh, I, I think it's, it's not a heavy lift. In fact, I think it will be much less expensive and much less risky than what we have been doing, the highly securitized approach we've had, and more likely to produce good results. You know, the bottom line is I think we can develop approaches that would allow us as Americans, as I said, even though we can't control what happens in the region, to look ourselves in the mirror and say, we're playing the most constructive role that we can. And yes, finally, we have to realize this is a process of decades, not, uh, not months or even a few years. And that's hard for us as Americans to face. But as the Arabs say, a sabr jamil, patience is beautiful. So thanks for your attention. I look forward to the discussion with you. Would you comment, please, on the role of reconciliation and what the US can do with certain partners to promote reconciliation as well as economic development? Okay, now I don't know if you have specific conflicts in mind, but... Um, well, for example, uh, at, in 2008, the strategic framework agreement that was put in place between Iraq and the United States had a lot of promise in many areas of, of engagement yeah. that could allow other countries to participate in well as well. And that focused at least on two areas. One was reconciliation of conflict, and the other was economic development, and neither has worked. Right. So... Um, Look, I think that, um, uh, so first of all, it's, it's always certainly worthwhile trying reconciliation, trying conflict mitigation. It's not always going to work, but sometimes it does, you know, and then it, it can save an incredible amount of trouble, as I said, had the United States uh, tried maybe to broker a solution to uh, the Yemen issue rather than just supporting the Saudi and Emirati, you know, military campaign there. I think, you know, because now that's getting back to um, negotiations, and negotiations pretty much on, the, on, on a basis that could have been negotiated before this conflict started in 2015. So it's worth trying. The United States is doing a little bit. I mean, I noted, for example, just today, uh, the United States hosted um, the foreign ministers of Egypt and Ethiopia in Washington for talks. They're, they have a, a serious conflict over Nile waters. And that can, you know, water is a big, I didn't, I didn't really didn't talk about climate change and water and that kind of thing in this region. It can, you know, it's getting more and more um, tense and it can lead to wars. So, you know, I'm, gl I'm glad the United States is doing that now because, you know, that we, a war between Egypt and Ethiopia would be a terrible thing, right? And so I, I think it's very much worth doing that. In terms of economic development, so this is something the United States must do, and the United States must work with the World Bank, you know, and the IMF and so forth on these things. But it is difficult. I mean, frankly, uh, you know, the economic and political situations get all knotted up together. And you end up, you know, it, it's very easy to put in a lot of effort and a lot of resources into economic development, and then the political situation prevents it from succeeding. Um, so, you know, but as we see now in the region that, you know, political arrangements are, the, 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 you know, are being rearranged, 
right? And that may, may create some openings. You know, in, in a place, uh, let's hope, in places like Iraq, in places like Lebanon, where there's now, people are really fed up with poor government performance and corruption and so forth, and they're, they're pushing back. That can provide an opening, you know, uh, when, the, when the, the citizens themselves are demanding change for, you know, international players like the United States to change their own engagements in, in, in change their own engagement in ways that, you know, foster economic development under a, a if not radically changed, at least altered political situation. Can you imagine a scenario under which the Kurds are able to uh, actualize their aspirations for a national homeland, possibly Iraqi Kurdistan or some other scenario? I have to say, I don't see things trending in that direction. You know, with everything that has happened in Iraq, for example, um, you know, Iraqi Kurdistan long was, and perhaps it still is, the most, most developed and the most functioning, you know, area of the country. Um, and there was a lot of speculation at a certain point that Iraq might break apart um, and that Iraqi Kurdistan might become, you know, an independent Kurdish state. But I don't see that that isn't where things have gone and it doesn't seem to be going there now. Uh, and, then, and then certainly in Syria and in Turkey, that's not the direction that things are going. So while I, I will never say that it will never happen, I will say that for now I don't see I don't think, see things going in that direction. Um, why has uh, Tunisia seen uh, some success? Um, it was where the Arab Spring began, so they clearly had problems, yeah. but they, they, it seems to be working there. Yes, it is working. So why did Tunisia see success? I would identify a couple of factors. One of them, I think, is human development. I think that, um, so Tunisia was a country uh, without any oil or gas, you know, in between two big countries, Algeria and Libya, that had that, those kind of resources, Tunisia didn't have it. It had to rely on its human capital. And, um, you know, they made a decision, Habib Bourguiba, you know, back uh, decades ago, you know, made a, made a decision. Now, he, he wasn't, it wasn't a democratic system, but he did decide to invest in human capital and education and in women's empowerment and getting women into the labor force. And I think that made a big difference in Tunisia. Another thing in Tunisia that made it different from some of the other Arab countries was that the military was not that powerful within the system. Unlike in Egypt, for example, the military didn't, or Algeria, the military didn't have, didn't dominate politics and didn't have the ability uh, to come in and impose its will. The other the last thing I would say about Tunisia is I think in a way it benefited from being a bit of a backwater, kind of off by itself and it, it didn't have the kind of extensive intervention that some of the other Arab countries have, whether we're talking economically, diplomatically, you know, other, other states in the region, whether we're talking the Arab states or uh, you know, Iran or whatever really intervened in some of the Arab states. But Tunisia was kind of, nobody thought it was that important. And so the Tunisians were left to their own to work things out, and, and they have done so. Uh, yes, in President Obama's famous um, Arab Spring speech, I'm, I'm not aware, well, that he said enough about the importance of the will of the people being balanced by the rule of law in a modern democratic society. And I wonder whether in Egypt, for example, if, if, Mubar if uh, Obama had tried to emphasize that, that the, as being equally important with the will of the people being, uh, being uh, done, um, whether instead of people taking to the streets immediately and demanding that Mubarak be deposed immediately, if they could have let his term as president run out according to law, vote him out and vote someone else in be more peacefully, uh, whether that, um, and whether, uh, and perhaps Obama simply saying something about the rule of law wouldn't have been enough to prevent that, prevent yeah. from happening what happened in those, in certain countries. Maybe it would have helped and mm -hmm. there would have been less violence and bloodshed in those in certain countries including yeah. Egypt. Yeah, I think look when when President Obama made that speech in Cairo in uh, uh, you know 
I think that he didn't, um, he didn't at all foresee what was coming. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think President Obama came into office expecting that, oh, these countries are boiling and they might, they might boil over. So I don't think he was expecting that at all. And um, I, I'm not sure how much of a difference. I, I don't think that what President Obama, I mean, people, people in the region liked what President Obama said in that speech, you know, um, and it gained him popularity. But I don't think people took it as some sort of a blueprint or, or what they were supposed to do. Unfortunately, you know, the rule of law in this region has been extremely weak. And, and Egypt is a prime example of this that has had all along rule by law not rule of law. In other words, the Constitution itself and laws are manipulated all the time in ways to you know, repress people and so forth. Uh, and so, unfortunately, Egyptians, you know, they really have not experienced the rule of law, or not, not for a very long time. Um, it's, it's not something that, um, you know, I, I hope for their sake they'll, they'll get there at some point, but it's not been on the table uh, at all. Thank you. With all the changes happening in the Middle East today, do you see or foresee like a reform or changes within Islam, and how will that um, affect the future of the region going forward? Yeah, th thank you. That's a it's a really interesting question because we see um, a number of um, leaders in the region. For example, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, or President Assisi of Egypt saying that they're reforming Islam and saying that they're trying to make the religious establishment more liberal and so forth. Um, I mean, actually, my colleagues and I at Carnegie are, are doing a study of this, trying to look at, well, well you know, what, is it, what does it really mean and what, are, what is actually being done inside these countries and how are things changing? Um, I think that, um, look, Islam has, at, you know, at, at their, as you know, there are different schools of Islam and there are different institutions within Islam and there are different sects within Islam. It's, it's not a monolith. But there, you know, like all world religions, it's been, it's been changing and evolving from within uh, over time. And I think that will, that will continue to happen. Um, you know, I think it's so. And I think in in the eyes of most people I, that I speak to who live in the region, they, they don't think the religion itself needs changing. But it's a question of um, religious institutions or how are different aspects of the religion applied within law by courts or within laws or how is it used by political institutions? Because it is very much Islam is very much used by political institutions and leaders to gain legitimacy? Uh, how is it used by political parties and social movements and this kind of thing? That's really what's more at issue, I think, for, uh, for a lot of Muslims. Okay, uh, so please join me in thanking you, Dr. Thank you, I've enjoyed being with you.